Saren Kierkegaard, Various Readings, A Brief History of Modern Philosophy, Six Book, The Philosophy of Romanticism, by Harold Hofting, translated by Charles Finley Sanders, 1912, pages 200 to 205. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romantic philosophy made a profound impression in the Scandinavian North, differing according to the different character of the northern peoples. In Sweden, the Romantic opposition to empirical philosophy is particularly evident. The fundamental principle of philosophy characteristic of Sweden was this, namely, that truth must be a perfect, inherently consistent totality, and since experience merely presents fragments and such, forsooth, as are constantly undergoing change, a constant antithesis of ideal and empirical truth must follow. After this idea had been elaborated by a number of thinkers, the most noteworthy of whom are Benjamin Hoyer and Eric Gustav Geyer, the school attained its systematic culmination in the philosophy of Christopher Jacob Bostrom, 1797-1866, professor of the University of Uppsala, according to whom time, change, and evolution are illusions of the senses whilst true reality consists of a world of ideas which differ from Platonism by the fact that the ideas are construed by personal beings. Denmark reveals the influence of Schelling and Hegel to a marked degree, especially among the writers in ascetics and the theologians. The more independent thinkers, however, have devoted themselves almost exclusively to the problems of psychology, ethics, and epistemology and assumed an attitude of decided opposition to abstract speculation. Frederick Christian Sibern, 1785-1872, who labored at Copenhagen in the capacity of professor of philosophy for more than 50 years, in opposition to Hegel and Bostrom, placed great stress on a real evolution in time. Experience reveals that evolution has a number of starting points and the contact of the various evolutional series with each other gives rise to strife, a stupendous debate of everything with everything, which in turn accounts for progress. This idea of sporadic evolution has likewise an important bearing on the theory of knowledge. Each cognizing being has the viewpoint of one of these beginnings, and hence cannot survey the entire process. Sibern devoted himself more particularly to psychology, for which he was specially adapted by his gift of observation and his enthusiastic interest in human life. We shall consider Saren Kierkegaard, 1813-1855, only as a philosopher, leaving out of account his ascetic and religious activities, which have taken such deep hold on the life of the North. The author of this textbook has given a general description of this thinker in his book Seren Kierkegaard als Philas in Froman's Klassiker. Kierkegaard is a subjective thinker in the sense in which he used that word in the book Unwissenschaftliche Nachschrift, Unscientific Postscript, 1846, Kierkegaard's chief philosophical work. The ideas of the subjective thinker are determined by the interplay of all the elements of psychic life, by emotion and reflection, by hope and fear, by tragic and comic moods. And this thinking takes place in the midst of the stream of life, whose boundaries we cannot see and whose direction we can never know, at least not in the fantastical and impersonal world of abstraction. Kierkegaard is the Danish Pascal, and his position in relation to the philosophy of his age possesses a certain analogy to Pascal's relation to Cartesianism. This predominantly personal character of his thought, however, does not preclude the possibility of his making valuable contributions to epistemology and ethics, or better, to a comparative philosophy of life, as he has actually done. 
Sibern had already observed that the fruitful ideas of Kant had not received their just dues at the hands of his successors. Kierkegaard renews the problem of knowledge with still greater definiteness and declares that Hegel had not solved the Kantian problem. We can arrange our thoughts in logical order and elaborate a consistent system. It is possible to elaborate a logical system, but a finite thinker will never be able to realize a complete system of reality. We deduce the fundamental ideas from experience, and experience remains forever imperfect. We understand only what has already taken place. Knowledge comes after experience. We cognize towards the past, but we live towards the future. This opposition between the past and the future accounts for the tension of life and impresses us with the irrationality of being. The denial of the reality of time by abstract speculation is the thing that constitutes the thorn in the problem of knowledge. What is thus true of scientific thought is even more so in the reflections on the problems of practical life. In this case, it is personal truth that takes first rank. For example, the important matter to be considered here is the fact that the individual has acquired his characteristic ideas by his own efforts and that they constitute an actual expression of his personality. Subjectivity constitutes the truth. Whoever prays to an idol with his whole heart and soul prays to the true God whilst he who prays to the true God from mere force of habit and without having his heart in it is really worshipping an idol. Kierkegaard shows his romanticism in the fact that he sharply contrasts the heart of life as it is actually experienced and entirely disregards intellectual integrity, which is an essential condition if personal truth is to escape identification with blindness. Kierkegaard outlined a kind of comparative theory of life, partly in poetic form, entweder, order, either or, stadion auf dem Liebensweg, stages on life's way, partly in philosophical form, in his chief philosophical treatise mentioned above. He distinguishes various stadia, which, however, do not constitute stages in a continuous line of evolution, but sharply severed types. The transition from the one to the other does not follow with logical necessity, nor by means of an evolution explainable by psychological processes, but by a leap, an inexplicable act of will. Kierkegaard maintains the qualitative antithesis of life in sharp contrast to the quantitative continuity of the speculative systems. According to Kierkegaard, the principle of evaluation and construction of theories of life consists in the degree of opposition which spiritual life is capable of comprehending. The particular moment in the totality of life, time and eternity, reality and the ideal, nature and God, constitute such antithesis. The tension of life increases in direct proportion to the increasing sharpness of the manifestation of these antitheses, and the energy which is supposed to constitute life must therefore likewise be correspondingly greater. The professional artist who is absorbed in the pleasure of the moment represents the lowest degree. The writer of irony already discerns an element of the inner life which is incapable of expression in a single moment or in a single act. The moralist develops this inner life positively by real influence on the family and in the state. The humorist regards all the vicissitudes of life as evanescent as compared with eternity and assumes an attitude of melancholy resignation, which he preferably makes the subject of jest. The devotees of religion regard the temporal life as a constant pain because finite and temporal existence is incommensurable with eternal truth. The Christian finally regards this pain as the effect of his own sins, and the antithesis of time and eternity can only be annulled by the fact that the everlasting itself is revealed in time and apprehended in the paradox of faith. 
Kierkegaard wanted to show by this scale how comprehensive an ideal of life was possible even outside of Christianity. He likewise wanted to put an end to the amalgamation of Christianity and speculation in theology. But the anguish occasioned by the tension finally became his standard for the sublimity of life and he had sufficient courage of consistency to draw the inference that the sufferings of no one are equal to those endured by God. This brings him into direct conflict with the romantic theory of the reconciliation of all antithesis in the higher unity, as well as with the accepted conception of Christianity. This furnished the motive for the deplorable controversy with the state church, which occupied the later years of his life. End of recording. A Brief History of Modern Philosophy. Six Book. The Philosophy of Romanticism. By Harold Hofting. Translated by Charles Finley Sanders. 1912. Pages 200 to 205.